You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 102 of the Common Descent Podcast. Today we're discussing parasites. Oh boy, a nice, simple, straightforward subject. I hope none of you are eating. (laughs) I hope all of you are eating. (laughs) Because something's eating you. (laughs) Today we're going to discuss parasites, which is not an, uh, like, a odd topic. We're all familiar with parasites, but they are way more complex than our typical day-to-day interaction with them would lead you to believe. Yeah. So we're going to look at the concept of parasitism more than going through every group of parasites because we can't do that nope that's not in 102 episodes no that would be more daunting (laughs) than when we did the history of earth (laughs) a million years a minute like we can't but it's a major part of life on earth which means that it is a major thing not only today but throughout the past yes as far as we can tell as long as there's been things to parasitize there's been parasites yep And they have found just a ridiculous number of weird lifestyles and some particularly unique strategies to survive. And so we're going to discuss what a parasite is, what are the techniques that parasites tend to use, you know, what are the methods that they benefit from their host, what do we find in the fossil record, Mm -hmm. you know, what do we, what evidence, direct evidence do we actually have of ancient parasites? And then how do we think things become parasites? Like, how do you go from being a normal, respectable <laughs> law organism, yes, <laughs> to a horrible, just... Moocher. Yeah. Moocher, um, yes. Moocher. There was one article that was the rise of the moochers. <laughs> yeah. And it was about their evolution. So we'll discuss all of that. We'll go through it. We're going to give lots of examples. We are not going to try to ke- cover the actual diversity of parasites because that's we just can't no this is going to be like our venom and poison episode yeah it's like there we, we'll give you some examples and the blog post will be full of links absolutely for you to, uh, pursue more information and so this is more the concept than the organisms doing it if any of them particularly pique your interest let us know and we'll add an episode for them on the list absolutely this episode was requested by three people who evidently wanted to hear about these creepy creatures. Our patron Kyle, Lori, and my friend Thomas. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, good request. I was excited to do this one. And before we get to the discussion, let's get some announcements out of the way. First and foremost, as usual these days, we have a Patreon. We do, and lots of patrons. And lots of patrons. And if you join us on Patreon at a certain level, we like to shout your name out. For example... We would like to welcome, first and foremost, Alejandro, who we missed. We did. Alejandro should have been a shout-out on episode 100. So, as... retroactive, <laughs> honorary episode 100 shout-out to Alejandro. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and along with Alejandro, we welcome David, Shannon, Dr. G, Dalton, Art, Magnus, Z Cyclist, and Alex. <sighs> wow. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Wow. Fantastic. There is also still time for you to enter questions for our end-of-the-year Q&A. That's true. We have a submission form up for you to send us your questions, which will be closing a couple days after this episode comes out. Yes. So for anyone, if this is your first time, ask us any kind of question you'd like to hear us answer, and we will be making what is shaping up to be a massive (laughs) Q&A mailbag episode where we will answer as many, I'm going to say as many for now, depending on what our final number yep. <laughs> ends up being, <laughs> a bunch of these questions and tell you whatever it is you're curious about. So follow the links, submit a question still quickly before we shut it down. <laughs> we'll be closing it on the 15th. So if you don't get there in time, we'll do it again next year. Absolutely. Stay tuned for that Q&A itself at the very end of the year. And thanks to everybody who sent us questions. Yes. No, there's been some good ones. I'm excited. And finally, we just a little bit ago did a live chat with uh, our patrons. Yeah, that was a ton of fun. And it was a ton of fun. It went really well. So thank you all, all of you who showed up and joined in. And for those of you who didn't show up, we're thinking about doing more stuff like that for patrons in the future. So keep your eyes out. 
That's about it for announcements. Nice and quick. Check those things out, which means we can move on to the news. Every episode, we like to gather up some paleoevolutionary biology news from the recent weeks. Keeps us up to date and keeps you all up to date. And so to start us off, what news do you have for us, David? How about a cool bird? I like birds. This cool bird in particular is a fossil bird from the late Cretaceous that has a beak we didn't expect to see in the late Cretaceous. Mm. Mm, Indeed. This is research by Patrick O'Connor et al. in Nature, and we'll link on the blog post to an article in Live Science by Laura Gegel. The new bird is known from a skull discovered in sandstone from the late Cretaceous of Madagascar, so about 68 million years ago. The block of sandstone with the skull was found about a decade ago, and then just a few years ago it was CT scanned to reveal what was inside, and now... Uh, This is the first publication and naming of the specimen. Man, I love CT scanning. It's the, uh, boy, it's a good time to be in paleontology. The skull itself is about three inches long, about eight and a half centimeters. As Laura writes in the article, it could fit in the palm of your hand. All right. The actual animal, the bird itself, would have been, as the authors uh, describe it, about crow-sized. So, late Mesozoic bird like a lot of mesozoic birds yeah similar in size and shape to modern birds yeah this bird has two major things that are really notable about it the first is that it's brand new they were able to identify it as a new genus and species called falcata kelly forsteray and the other thing that really stands out about it is its beak the beak is long and deep so think tall sort of robust Or if you want the comparison that the authors and the the article make, kind of like a toucan. I was going to say toucan. (laughs) Yep. It kind of has this toucan-like beak. It's not just big and deep, you know, like you could fit a lot up in there. Kind of like a parrot, but Mm -hmm. also long. Yeah. Kind of like a toucan or birds like toucans. The beak is mostly toothless. It's got some teeth up in the front. But also mostly toothless. So this is kind of a toucan-like beak at a time where birds don't aren't known to have had quite the diversity of beak shape that we see today. Yeah, we're used to them having lots of weird beaks nowadays. Right, which is kind of a feature of the Neorniths, the modern group of birds that, that we have all over the place today, That they have these diverse beak shapes and these different behaviors they're Mm -hmm. doing with their beaks, feeding behaviors, other behaviors. But we don't quite see that kind of diversity in Mesozoic birds. Now, why that is, is always hard to say. It could be that it was just early on and they hadn't quite struck those diversity Mm -hmm. jackpots yet. But one of the suggestions that's gone around is that it might be a constraint of the structure of mesozoic bird beaks today's birds their beaks are mostly a bone called the premaxilla Mm -hmm. so their mouth is kind of dominated in its structure by this one particular bone which is not what we see in other mesozoic birds so some have said well okay maybe it's something about that bone structure that bone format that is what allows birds today to have all this diversity So if that were true, we would not expect to see a strange toucan-like beak in a Mesozoic bird that doesn't have a beak like that, and that's exactly what this is. Yeah. This is a Mesozoic bird whose beak is more like early birds and closely related dinosaurs, where it a big part of the beak is the bone called the maxilla, the upper part of the beak at least, which is, you know, we have that in our Mm -hmm. bone, it's the major bone in a lot of dinosaur, theropod, velociraptor-like animal skulls. Yeah, it's it's the bone that holds most of the teeth in the upper part of the skull. Right. For most of these animals. Right, the maxilla. Where the premax, the premaxillary bone, is way up front and it's relatively small. But finding a bird with the quote-unquote old-style <laughs> mouth, the old-style beak... The old-school head. Kind of throws a wrench in that suggestion that maybe you don't have to have a modern bird beak format to have modern bird style diversity. Mm -hmm. This is a case of a convergent evolution 
of this kind of beak, even though the jaw itself is built slightly differently. Well, it's it's a, a neat situation where, you know, I, I haven't seen the bird, but if, if it is as toucan-y, you, it means you could put it up next to some of our birds today, and it would look very similar, and then if you x-rayed it, it would look very different. Yes. That the bones inside the beak are not the same, or in the same position Yes, and in fact, listeners, go to the blog post to see these pictures, but I'm showing Will the artist reconstruction of the dinosaur now. I'm glad that's what the artist reconstruction is, because I've been picturing Zazu in my head the whole time. <laughs> it looks kind of like... I think this is Mark Witten. It's got a uh, bit of a hornbill. Yes. Yeah. The other fun thing about finding a convergent structure is, of course, it leads to suggestions of potentially convergent behavior. That if you... Why would this animal have a toucan-like beak? Perhaps it is doing toucan-like things, which, to my knowledge, toucans use their beaks for eating fruit, mm-hmm. big slash tough food, and I believe at least some of the species will also bat at each other with their beaks. Yes. Like, they'll have little sparring matches smacking their beaks at, uh, at each other. So these Mesozoic birds, before the rise of birds as we know them, might have been doing very similar things. Which I I love because it makes sense. You know, it, mm-hmm. we see this constantly when we look at older groups where, you know, we'll go to a group and it's like, yeah, you know, these are related to the animals today, but they're not quite, you know, they don't have a lot of the diversity of the ones today. And then we find an aardvark-like version, you know, right. something weird where it's, okay, well, evidently we were wrong. And so it makes sense that there were early birds mm-hmm. that were doing it. It's just now it... it adds a bit more mystery as to, okay, then why weren't we seeing more of it? Right. If it was possible, then why was it more common? Yeah. Or it raises the question of what are we missing? Yes. What haven't we found? Have we not yet found the Mm flamingo-like Mesozoic birds or the the shoebill-like Mesozoic birds? Which then could raise the question of, is there some reason that they're not preserving? If they Mm -hmm. were around, why aren't, are we just not finding them or are they not preserved for some reason right and yeah it's it's a cool find that that raises all sorts of cool questions which is always fun yeah neato well my first bit of news is about alligators of course it is uh and 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 crocodilians in general but uh this study was looking at alligators particularly and it is modern but it does have some weird features for the crocodilian group okay yeah this is about the fact that at least some crocodilians, it's been noted in a few groups, can regrow the tips of their tails when they are young. I've seen this headline bouncing around recently. Yes, which is evidently a thing that I'm both very excited about this news and a little upset because I learned about it for the first time while reading this (laughs) news, which bothers me. (laughs) So tail regrowth is known from a bunch of groups of animals. Yes. Like there are a bunch of lizards Mm -hmm. that do it. Uh, I want to say salamanders will do it. But certain other groups don't seem like mammals tend not to regrow their tails. Exactly. And And crocs prior to this thing, at least as far as I was aware, also are not expected to be able to regrow tails. Well, and, and so the weird thing with this study is that it actually isn't new knowledge. There's I found papers going back to the 30s talking about hmm. them regrowing the tips of their tails. Just no one was telling me about it. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little miffed. Should have listeners. been around in the 30s. Uh, but no one knew how they were doing it. No one had taken a close look. And this research has done that, actually dissected and looked at how the tail's regrown. And it's not using the same regrowth techniques as other groups that regrow their tails. Tell me more. This is research by Cindy Shu et al. in Scientific Reports, and the article is in Science Alert by Tessa Komunderos. So, crocodilian tails. As I just said, this is something that has been reported on multiple times of evidence that they, young crocodilians, because it's not with adults, it is only with fairly small juvenile it's crocs. Still growing. Yes. That have shown the ability to regrow not the whole tail, but the tips portion of the tail. But it's never been looked at what's regrowing. What does the inside of that new growth look like? Because the groups that regrow their tails don't all regrow them the same way. Some regrow parts that others don't and in different formats. This study took a closer look at that 
Now, to give you an idea of when we say regrowing the tip of the tail, they said that a juvenile American alligator can regrow up to 18% of their total body length of that, that tail tip, which can, comes out to about 23 centimeters or 9 inches. That's that's not nothing. Which is not nothing. That is that is enough that that makes a difference. Yeah. You know, we're not talking about like, you know, the, like getting your fingertip chopped off. You still have a mostly functional hand. This is this would make your tail more functional. Now, to put in perspective, the other groups that have regrowth, famous ones as we were saying, lizards, salamanders, the axolotl is really the champion for mm-hmm. vertebrates of regeneration. Which is something to say regeneration is what we're talking about. That's This is a particular type of healing, which is not just healing a wound, but regenerating lost material. When axolotls regenerate, they reform a segmented skeleton in place of the bone that they lost and musculature to go along with that. So it's not the exact same, you know, necessarily perfectly, but it is bones and muscle to replace the ones that were lost. Right. It's made of the same stuff. Yes. And in the same general format. When lizards regrow their tail, typically they don't reform the muscle. And they don't have a segmented skeleton. But they will right. regrow a skeletal structure to support it. Right. It's just not the same bone separation as the tail that they lost. Right. It's sort of the the, the quick and cheap job. Yes. The patch job. And the musculature means it's not a active tail anymore. Alligators don't do the muscle, and they don't do skeleton at all. Hmm. They have a cartilage tube and no musculature. So it is by far the simplest of these three. It is a tail-shaped regrowth. They found this out by doing histology, so, you know, slicing it thinly and looking at those layers. And they hypothesize that either the cost of regrowing muscle may just not, may be too high to be worth it. Mm-hmm. But evidently, there is still some benefit to having an immobile tail tip. Right, yeah, those that those nine inches make a difference for the animal. Exactly. So there's still something useful to having this, this section. Hmm. Now, another distinction from the others, they can't self-amputate. So this is not like a lizard that can lose its tail and right. act- actively lose it for survival purposes. Right, they, they can't autotomize yes. the tail where they go... Here, predator, you deal with that mm-hmm. while I hide. This, I assume, is more if another gator bites yes. your tail off, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you can recover a bit. Exactly what the researcher said is when a bigger individual tears the tip of your tail off when you're young, you can regrow part of it. Yeah. Which makes sense being a, as a handy thing for gators to be able to do because as you may be aware if you look at a lot of gators and crocs, they tend to bite chunks off of each other quite frequently. Yep. Now, the tissue that's regrown actually looks much more like scar tissue than actually regenerated. It looks like the tissue that forms when us mammals, or as they point out, tuataras, are injured and heal. Yeah, that's what I was wondering if it was mm-hmm. like scar tissue. And so it's kind of this weird mixture between regeneration and wound repair. Mm-hmm. So they're they're healing a wound... Into the shape of a tail. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of weird. But there are some similarities with other groups. The way they regrow the cartilage, they do regrow blood vessels. So this is still like, this isn't a dead, you know, fleshy bit. It is, there's blood that there, there's nerves, and scales do reform. So, I mean, it still is a living part of the body. It's just not going to move the way it used to. And those... Features are very similar to the way lizards regrow Mm -hmm. uh, or regrow those things. But it also does seem like it takes considerably longer, which is not super surprising. They said for some skinks, it can take as little as six months to regrow a tail. While a black caiman was measured taking 18 months to reform. And then really the final note is this is not the first time we've seen this in this group. There's actually fossil evidence Ooh. for tail regrowth in crocodiliforms. There was a teleosaurid, which are the a group of the marine crocodiliforms, called Steniosaurus bolensis from the Upper Triassic that showed fossil evidence of an amputated tail tip that was 
followed where the amputation was by what seems to be a cartilaginous regeneration. Oh, cool. So this is evidently something that Crocs, the, the overall crocodilomorph group, has at least somewhat ancestrally, maybe? Interesting. Which raises the question, is this an archosaur feature? I was going to say, are and we going to find a dinosaur that's with a, a regrown tail tip? That's exactly what they said. And if that is true, when and why did they lose it? Right. Why don't we see birds doing stuff like that? Yeah. Because well, so, they don't have tails. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, once again, not as new information as I would have liked it to be, but <laughs> a new look at this weird feature that crocs have fascinating Mm -hmm. cool stuff also really cool to hear that there's fossil evidence because tail regrowth in the fossil record is not new i remember at least one study of a lizard that seemed to have regrown its tail uh in the fossil record but certainly a rare find yeah and cool well keeping things in the archosaur realm my next bit of news is about birds specifically bird diversity and how Diversity and evolution of birds, or our understanding of it, can be influenced by human impact on birds. Oh, yeah. Tell us how we screwed it up. Yep. That's what this is about. (laughs) This is research by Farron Sayall et al. in Science Advances, and we'll link to a press release on phys.org via the University of Gothenburg. As we mentioned earlier, birds today tend to be very diverse, and one of the things that birds seem to do a lot amidst their diversity is not flying. Yeah. Flightlessness has shown up many, many times in birds, particularly in places like islands. We've talked about island evolution gets weird, Mm -hmm. episode four. Where they just spurn their gift of flight. Because they don't need it no more. (laughs) Ungrateful. It's estimated that flightlessness has evolved many different times in many different groups of birds. But human activity, as we have discussed, is not always good for other species. And one type of animal, that broad type of animal that tends to really come out on the bad side of that interaction are flightless birds. Mm -hmm. Humans have been extremely negatively impactful on species. Birds in general, but flightless birds especially, Mm -hmm. as we traveled around the world and took over different land masses in our journeys. Which and and that's on top of how normally devastating we are to island ecosystems anyway. Right. (laughs) And this study is about how our impact can affect our understanding of the evolution of this feature. Specifically how when we're trying to understand bird diversity and evolution. We're, you know, with any animal, really, we tend to be operating with the world that we have. Mm -hmm. But because of that skewed impact on flightless birds, the world that we have might not actually be a good representation of birds. Yeah, it's similar to what we always talk about with our extinction episodes, that the world we live in today is not necessarily a, a representation of any time before it. Right. And now it's just the world we've created. (laughs) Yes. So in this study, they compiled data on bird species that have gone extinct over the past 126,000 years. So basically listing what are the bird species that have gone extinct in that time period, which is a time period during which humans were spreading around the world and negatively impacting ecosystems basically everywhere. In that time, they compiled evidence of 581 species of birds that have gone extinct in that time, which is a really depressing number that we don't have time to dwell on right now. Go listen to episode 55. (laughs) Within 85 different families of birds. Among that list, 166 of those species were flightless, or at least bad flyers, right? Flightless or very nearly flightless. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So about 30%... Of this list of recently extinct birds have been flightless, which goes to show you how heavily heavy our impact is on flightless birds versus birds in general. Yeah, we, yeah, a group that already isn't a majority of birds. Right. And a significant percentage of the ones we took out were them. But their big takeaway message is how this changes our understanding of bird diversity. Today, they cite, there are about 60 species of flightless birds alive today. 
species considered fully or nearly flightless. But if you expand that to include all of these extinct species from the last 100,000 years or so, it goes up to almost 230. Mm -hmm. So if you take out the human impact, there would, there, there in theory would be about four times as many flightless birds. And they also uh, pointed out that when you run estimates on flightlessness evolution, so looking at birds, assessing flightlessness across different groups, estimating how many different times flightlessness evolved. When they ran those models using just living species, they estimate that flightlessness evolved about 35 times. But when they include the extinct groups, they estimate about 150 times. Wow. Again, about a four times increase. Which means that if we limit our view to just what's left today, we're actually hiding a lot of bird evolution and diversity. That flightlessness is not only more common among birds, quote-unquote, today, (laughs) but also more, not not just more common in number of species, but more commonly evolved. Yeah, in, in the evolutionary trends of birds. And so, as you said, this is something that we talk about a lot, that when we're trying to interpret evolution and we're trying to interpret diversity, we tend to oftentimes get stuck looking at what we have today. Mm -hmm. And we've talked before about how that doesn't always work because elephants or red pandas might not actually be a good representation of the entire history of their group. This is a study that points out that what we have today versus what was there before 100,000 years of human activity (laughs) before boats is dramatically different and com- could potentially completely change our understanding of the patterns in bird evolution not to not to mention whatever other group evolutions we have impacted in that time well i feel like this is a really important thing to acknowledge because it it at least in my mind speaks to two big cognitive dissonances that human brains stumble upon which is one out of sight out of mind mm-hmm. it's real easy to forget about the things that are not currently present yes you know even if it's just recently gone it only takes so long before it's just easy to discount them Mm -hmm. so it's really important to remember that what's here in front of us is not what was here in front of us fairly recently and then the other one is that a hundred thousand years is a lot of human history but that's not deep time like that's very recent in bird evolution yeah to the point where and it, it's probably not 100%, but you could argue that without the impact of humans, most of those species would probably still be here. Yeah, it, it would the, be kind of surprising if we, if we you know, magically time machined or, or, or portaled to a world where this hadn't happened and the numbers were the same. Right, that we have had an extreme effect on flightless birds which has an extreme effect on our understanding of flightlessness in birds. Yeah, and what it seems like those went extinct a long time ago, but they didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that is basically today as far as fossils and evolution is concerned. So I feel like this is a really important bit of research cuz I I would bet and I am ready to be depressed by these future researches, but mm-hmm. that this mentality could be applied to tons of taxa oh yeah that we could go Fish, through bugs, plants yep. oh yep, my yep, yep. goodness plants and see that we've shaped things enough already that if you just if you go around the world spend billions of dollars and survey everything that's on the planet right now it will still be wrong until you take into consideration the last you know few thousand years of human effects yeah <laughs> on these these groups the study is also a, a pretty explicit endorsement of the value of paleontology so woo woo go fossils <laughs> <laughs> or more more accurately go find fossils yes well speaking of reinterpreting old histories of certain groups this research takes a look at some of the oldest evidences for the presence of animals Ooh. in the fossil record and says well maybe not So we're going way back. Way back. This is looking at potential chemical evidence. Uh, Not new. This is, these are things that have been discovered. Potential molecular evidences for what would likely be the earliest sponges going way, way back. And showing that those molecular traces 
may be misleading according to this these new findings. Gotcha. And this is actually a two-part research. This is, these were cooperative research papers that were worked on and published in tandem. So these papers are by Leonard Van Muldigem et al. and Ilya Bobrovsky et al., both in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. And the article we'll be linking to is in the conversation by a slew of these authors cool. <laughs> from both papers. Yeah. So when we look back at the earliest evidences for animals, we're going back to the Cambrian and just before. And beyond. The simplest animals today generally are sponges, which are often looked at to as, as potentials for what the first animals may have been like. Right, representatives of the oldest animals. The, you know, the most basal of animal life. And so they may be, as they put it, the root for animals, so to speak. The oldest fossil remains we have of sponges go back 540 million years ago, early Cambrian. Boom. Cambrian with the Cambrian explosion, this is where we expect to find early animal fossils. Right. Episode 9. Also, maybe episode 31. Yes. <laughs> But then if we go back further to the Ediacaran biota, which episode, we talked episode about. Episode 31. There we go. I was right. <laughs> about up to 40 million years before that Cambrian explosion, we have a bunch of organisms, some of which have decent evidence these days of being animals. Yeah, maybe animals. Yes, maybe animals or very animal-esque. Yeah, almost animals. The one that is typically pointed to is Dickinsonia, which looks like a, a oval quilted mattress sort of thing. Inflatable mattress looking creature that could be like a meter in size. Which is monstrous for the Ediacaran. Which is notable. And recently, which I think we did it in the news, they found they found trace evidence in a Dickinsonia fossil of cholesterol. Oh, yeah, I think we did talk about this. And if it has cholesterol, animal cholesterol, that would make Dickinsonia an animal, very likely. Mm -hmm. Which would be, this fossil was 558 million years old, which would make Dickinsonia the oldest, that specimen, oldest confirmed mm -hmm. animal. Yep, with evidence that is molecular instead of morphological, because that's what we have to do yes. <laughs> when we get to those points. Because when you're dealing with balloon animal versions of animal life <laughs> in the Ediacaran, you gotta, you gotta get creative. But... There are even older molecules that may be evidence for animals. So we're not talking about life, just animals. Mm -hmm. May be older evidence for animals going back 635 million years. Whoa. Which are sterols. S-S-T-E-R-O-L-S. -S yeah, so not cholesterols. Yep. Sterols. Sterols. These are from Oman in the Arabian Peninsula. And these were found in 2009. And... At the time of this research, the only group today known to make sterols are sponges. Mm. So if these are indeed sterols, that's evidence for sponge-like organisms over 600 million years ago. Yeah, potentially the oldest animals. Potentially the oldest animals. And these have been found around the world, these kind of molecular traces, which would mean that sponges may have been covering ocean floors and yeah. abundant during this time sponge earth but here's where we get into tricky territory when fossils are formed they're buried and put under pressure and put under heat which can change molecular structures sure can and that's what the researchers pointed out and wanted to investigate with these dual researches was those sure do look like sponge molecules but could they have been made to look like sponge molecules? Right. Are we seeing their original form mm -hmm. or have they been altered? Is there something that could be easily altered via pressure and heat to look like sponge sterols? Is this evidence as solid as it seems? Mm -hmm. So that's what they looked into. Each study looked at this problem from different angles. One study, handled by Leonard uh, Van Mulgen and Benjamin Nettersheim, focused on the sterile molecules that are preserved in rocks, and some of these go back to almost 800 million years old. Mm -hmm. They found a connection between these molecular traces and compounds known to be generated through geological alterations. Okay. So they started looking at those, since this seemed like they might share an origin, 
and they did experiments to simulate the effect of geological heating on molecules from algae. And the resulting signatures they got were very similar to those found in the old rocks. Mm. So altered algae could potentially produce molecules like this. Exactly. And those are not animals. Those are not animals. So it would show that the fossil fat maybe may actually be teaching us about early algae, not early animals. Which is still cool. Which is still very cool. The second study, which was led by Ilya Bobrovsky, focused on green algae specifically, which today are mainly common in freshwater and in like tidal pools, but used to be global five to 650 million years ago. They also heated algae molecules in the laboratory. They found that some of the common sterols in green algae, because they also have sterile-like structures or sterols of their own, were easily altered to look like sponge sterols. Mm. And so if that's the case, these old evidences of sponges are not animal at all. If, if If it was altered by the heat... So these studies in tandem bring into question that evidence. Right. It, 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 one of the things that we're always trying to do is find evidence that is incontrovertible. Yes. It's like we found a thing and the thing tells us this. This study is saying, well, that thing, while interesting, might not actually definitely tell you that. And we, we could... We need more evidence to support that conclusion. Exactly. We could retest this with some other technique and find that, you know, oh, actually we were able to find a signature by the sponge and yep, it sure is. But these findings don't look good for it being animal evidence. Right. It it doesn't mean that the sponge conclusion is definitely wrong, but it does mean that the sponge conclusion isn't definitely right. Exactly. So as, as is so often the conclusion with scientific studies, We need more evidence to draw conclusions. And this study is important and cool because it's dealing with the earliest animals, which always are heavily debated. Right. And getting a dual paper look at some of that evidence is how we try to refine these very old, very early findings where resolution isn't that great. And we like uh, every now and then to look at a study like this where the conclusion is basically... Looking at another conclusion and casting some doubt on it, because as we've mentioned before, that's how science works. Absolutely. And it's always important to point it because when a study comes out that says, hey, we found molecules that look like sponge molecules and these could potentially be evidences for early animal like creatures. What the headlines say oftentimes is evidence of earliest animals found, which isn't why what it is yeah the title will be earliest animals were sponges and they were this old right so then when a study like this comes out and they say okay yeah we we actually have some reason to potentially doubt those findings what the headlines are liable to say in many cases is earliest evidence for animals not animals but algae actually Mm -hmm. scientists say because the the journey from scientific conclusion to journalistic headline, especially when the journalistic headline is being irresponsible yes. or sensationalist a bit, masks that scientific process of, well, the conclusions were always tentative. These are always maybes and possiblies, and we're on the way to learning these things. And so it's fun every now and then to take a moment and go, hey, here's actually where the debate is. Here's why this is still confusing. Here's why we need more information down the line. And it's the process of science, which is the, 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 the thing that we like. Well, basically, anytime you see a scientific news article title that says something to the degree of, we've solved this question. Mm -hmm. That's not what happened. Probably not. 90% of the time, that's not what happened. That's not what the scientists said. Mm -hmm. And that's not at all what the situation is. But that's that's much catchier. (laughs) Yeah. So a cool study. uh, And there'll be more. Maybe maybe we'll talk about the next one, the next stage in this discovery. For sure. But for now, that brings us to the end of the news which means we can transition to talking about some very weird organisms that we are all much closer with than we might like. There are some, there are some of them in the room right now. (laughs) 
most of us are pretty familiar with the concept of what a parasite is. But let's define it anyway. The steal Superman's powers. Yes. Uses them against him. Uh, for a short amount of times, if you touch bare skin contact. You gotta be careful. Parasites are any organism that lives in a form of symbiosis with another organism. Uh, steal Spider-Man's powers. Yes. <laughs> Where they benefit off of the other organism and the other organism is harmed. Yeah, they benefit at the expense of the of the host organism. Yeah, so this is a form of symbiosis in the fact that it is a persistent, long-term relationship between two organisms. But typically when we hear symbiosis, we think mutualism or commensalism. Right, we're, we're either both doing well off of this. Yeah, we're or both benefiting. At the very least, no one's getting harmed by it. Yeah, the, one the of birds you... just hanging out on my back and eating bugs and stuff. Yeah, it's eating the bugs I stir up from the grass, but none of those bugs are bothering me. Right. So typically with symbiosis, that's what we think of. Parasitism is technically a form of symbiosis. It's just now you're eating stuff out of the host. Yeah. It, well, it goes from <laughs> both benefiting, one benefiting and one neutral, one benefiting and one harmed. Yes. Parasite, parasitism comes from the Latin parasitus, which is the Latinized version of the Greek parasitos, which means one who eats at the table of another. That's fantastic. Isn't that wonderful? Wow. <laughs> That's what a parasite is. I am taking what is yours for myself. I drink your milkshake. I drink your milkshake. <laughs> and the milkshake is you. <laughs> this makes parasitism similar to predation mm -hmm. in many ways, that you are feeding off of another organism which is what predators do. Yep. <laughs> I kill you and then I feed off of you. Mm -hmm. The difference really is that predation is not symbiosis because it is brief. Right. It's not a long-term relationship. Exactly. It is typically a, a very short-lived relationship. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> short-lived for one. Yep. It, it lasts just, just long enough for dinner. Exactly. So parasites are very similar to predators in many ways, but they aren't technically predators because of the length of interaction, typically. Mm -hmm. Which, since we're using time as a gauge, means that there is a very blurry of course. distinction with some. But one entomologist, E.O. Wilson, described parasites as predators that eat prey in units less than one. <laughs> <laughs> That's phenomenal. <laughs> they don't eat the full animal. They eat just a bit. <laughs> just little bits. Decimals. Now... We're all familiar with parasites. As you think of just parasites that we have to deal with, tapeworms, right. mosquitoes. D uh, mites, yeah. ticks, etc. Lice. So parasites are not like a, a foreign topic of conversation. They're something that could very well come up in a doctor's visit. Mm -hmm. Or a vet visit. Or a vet even visit. Even more likely. Absolutely. But a lot of our experience with parasites is very us-centered, mm -hmm. which can lead people to not understand how successful and diverse and numerous parasites actually are. Yeah. It it sounds strange and weird to us because we are not parasitic organisms. No. But parasitism is like one of life's top I like like if it was family feud and the question was like things life does. Parasitism yes. is going to be way up there. And in fact, a, a number of studies have estimated that at least 40% and up to 50% of species of organism on the planet are parasites. Which kind of makes sense if you think about the fact that a parasite is an organism that feeds off of another organism. Yes. <laughs> so every species is a potential host for parasites. Mm -hmm. So those numbers actually kind of make a bunch of sense if you think that every species has parasites. And make even more sense when you realize that parasites can parasitize other parasites. That's so, true. <laughs> so they actually have even more it's, options than we think. It's parasites all the way down. Yes. So parasites are ridiculously successful. But insanely successful. The numbers we're going to quote with some of these are kind of hard to believe at times. But yeah, parasites are something life just tends to do. About half the time. <laughs> and they've done it in basically every group of life. There's a parasitic version of effectively every organism. And 
almost every organism, every species, has its own parasite, at least one, if not many. Oh yeah, we we humans have tons. Yeah, there's there's lots of things that want to live in us. And that goes for basically any other form of life. So yeah, parasites, <laughs> they're everywhere. Get used to yep. it. <laughs> now, another distinction that gets tricky with parasites is between a parasite and a pathogen. Yes, I w- I've been thinking this. Yeah, because parasites are something we deal with at hospitals mm-hmm. because they are very much... We we say that you're infected a lot of the time. Oh, yeah. And a pathogen is a disease causing mm-hmm. organism, virus, bacteria, etc. And depending on how you define things, there are many bacteria that could be considered parasites that are living off of other organisms, but typically not killing that organism. Mm-hmm. That's a parasite. But we don't typically categorize bacterial infections as a parasitic infection. We classify it as a pathogen as a disease the same also goes for viruses if you count them as life if they if they fall in that umbrella enough yeah go back to episode 100 yeah i saw one description that called them obligate intercellular parasites yeah they parasitize cells and that's all they do yep so once again the lines are kind of blurry because as always we're trying to put nature in boxes and that's not how nature works And in fact, a lot of the sources I looked at while taking notes for this episode included examples of bacteria and viruses when discussing parasites. We aren't, we're going to kind of keep pathogens and parasites separate for this episode, if only for the sake of time and and Mm -hmm. content. We will be happy to do a viruses episode. (laughs) Or bacteria or diseases and stuff. But... We're, we're not, they're not going to be most of our examples or, or they're not going to be referenced as heavily as maybe some of the others, but we could, if we decided to group them in. So it's, it's a, it, parasite is kind of a, a weird form of life or lifestyle because it, it doesn't fit into most of the ways of surviving that we're used to with the bigger organisms. You, you're either making your own food like a plant you're either eating those things like an herbivore or you're eating the herbivores like a predator. Right. Or you're eating poo and decomposing yeah. things and, you know, the classic food web roles. Parasites don't really fit that style that we typically think of as a food chain. Yes. They are more just littered throughout the food chain. Yeah, they, they are siphoning off the food chain. Exactly. So... It means that for us in our brain, they're sometimes hard to categorize and grasp, but there are some categories. Parasites do have some typical patterns to the way they survive. The first two main ones is you have your obligate and your facultative parasites. Right. Ones that have to do it and ones that do it sometimes. Exactly. Obligate are parasites every time, all the time. And in other words, they need a host to survive. Without a host organism... They cannot cl- compl- They at least cannot complete their lifestyle. You know, they may not die instantly, but they will not go on to the next generation. Faculative parasites may be sometimes parasites, or they may be mostly, but can survive without a host. You know, there's lots of variants there, but there's lots of animals that are not parasites all the time. Right. Another part of the blurriness of mm-hmm. parasite is I'm a parasite when I choose to be. <laughs> You'll also find different categories for where the parasites are on the host. Uh, The two big ones, endoparasites and ectoparasites. Inside and outside. Inside your body, outside your body. Tapeworms versus lice. Exactly. Or roundworms versus fleas. And so these are basically all parasites get categorized into these two groups. There is a third, mesoparasites, which is that they are partially embedded. Ugh. Is this like bot flies? <laughs> I, I couldn't find a confirmation that bot flies counted, but the examples they give are copepods, which mm. are these small crustaceans that parasitize fish by crawling in an orifice and then staying there. So Right, in the gills or in the yeah. mouth. So you can see them. They're not all the way in the fish, but they're not on the fish's skin. They're partway right. in. Weird. Yeah, it was super gross. <laughs> and then we get to the strategies of parasitism like how they are feeding off the host because being a parasite doesn't just mean i'm eating your body Mm -hmm. 
It could be I'm eating your food. I'm taking your resources of some other form. Right. I'm taking something. I'm taking a benefit from you that hurts you when I take it. And that's always something important to remember when we talk about resources it's easy to get very food oriented because yeah. food is so important well that's the base resource right that and we it, think of and it's dinner time mm -hmm. so it's easy to do the thing but you know no, resources parasitism isn't just about taking food it's about taking resources of some kind yes there are six main strategies to being a parasite at least a eukaryotic parasite you know with Fancy cells like we has. Right. Leaving out all of the disease vector things. Mm -hmm. There are really six ways that it seems parasites consistently fall upon, which we'll talk about later when we get into parasitic evolution. But yeah, these seem to be a pretty consistent lifestyle strategies for parasites. And they go thusly. Directly transmitted parasitism is what we typically think of with most of our parasites like lice i bump into david some lice jump off me onto david they are directly transmitted and now david has lice right uh sorry to tell you this way should have been social distancing <laughs> these are your simple life cycle in that they have a host they need one host for their life cycle and they just go from one of those hosts to another host for the next generation and then that's basically it these could be internal or external, you know, so you can, it doesn't have to be things on the body. It could be stuff internally, but these include most, you know, a, a athlete's foot and fungus like that, that mm -hmm. you can, I, I stepped where you stepped and now the fungus is on me. Right. I drank the same water you drank, yeah. that, those kinds of things. And so directly transmitted, trophically transmitted parasitism Ooh. is you have to eat it. Yeah. So I, I'm guessing this sounds like it's the, the that sort of lancet fluke scenario yes. where i've parasitized this animal and then when that animal gets eaten when the frog gets eaten by a bird now i am parasitizing the bird exactly that's the thing that's unique with trophically transmitted parasites they must be eaten by their definitive host which is what the primary host is often called that's the one they actually mature and reproduce in mm-hmm but they have to get there through an intermediate host. Right. I think the Lancet fluke example, if I'm thinking of the right one, was actually ants that get eaten by herbivores off of the grass. And then the herbivores poop out the parasite and then snails eat the poop. And then the ants eat the snail yep. goo or yep. whatever. You're being transmitted through dinner. Yes. And so it can have multiple intermediate hosts. Mm -hmm. The main thing is that you have there's a host that I need to get into first. That is not where I'm going to grow up and reproduce. That is not where I'm going to reach maturity. This is just a vessel. Yeah, this is just a, a studio apartment. <laughs> and this is going to get me to my next true host where I'm going to spend the majority of my adult life right. by getting eaten. Yep. <laughs> I'm going to get my <laughs> mouse or my frog or my ant to be eaten alive. And then I will survive the digestion process and enter the body of this new animal. The f definitive, the primary host, is almost always a vertebrate. These also get really crazy in the fact that many trophically transmitted parasites will modify the intermediate host to make them more easily eaten. Yeah. And they'll do this in a number of ways. They'll do physical mo modifications. They'll do behavioral modifications yeah. to make them act in a way that makes them more easily eaten. Yeah, those ants, I think, are made to crawl up on top of grass during the day while grazers are out. Yep. The one that I always love the most is the flatworms, Riboroya, that live inside birds, deposit their eggs in the poop of the bird. So when the bird poops out, eggs are dropped into typically water, hopefully. The swimming larvae then go find snails mm -hmm. and asexually multiply in the snail, but they're not reproducing sexually, so they're not getting any, you know, mixing of the genes. Mm -hmm. They then leave the snail and find tadpoles. Mm -hmm. Inside the tadpoles, they attack the leg buds where the frog legs are going to come from and just mess them up. Yeah. So that either no legs form or too many legs form, <laughs> or you get like half a normal leg. And then at the knee joint, two legs start like it's, it looks like Lovecraftian body horror. Yeah. They're just 
st- inserting themselves into the place where leg cells are supposed to be developing. And just get in the just way. Makes it a big mess. And you get Cronenberg frogs. And then those frogs can now no longer properly hop or swim away from predators, a.k.a. another bird or mammal. And then inside that predator, the flatworm turns into its final form and goes and feeds off their their nutrients. Uh, I think they go to the liver, if I remember right. And then makes more eggs. And the cycle continues. And so on. So you can get real weird with these life cycles. These are often called complex parasite lifestyles. And they sure are. And so simple is your direct, complex, usually are referring to trophically transmitted. Probably one of the most familiar to all of us are micropredators, our next group, which are actively hunting their prey down and feeding a little bit off and then going on to another host. These are defined as using multiple hosts per generation. Hmm. Mosquitoes, ticks, leeches, vampire bats, lamprey. Gotcha. Your bloodsuckers. Right. You're taking a little bit from several different hosts. Yeah. I'm actively hunting a host out, stealing a little bit of their biomass, Mm -hmm. typically in the form of blood. Most of these are hematophagic. Yeah. Sanguivores. Sanguivores. And then... I'm using this to either survive, you know, vampire bats, this is my main source of food. And like mosquitoes, females need the blood to reproduce. Mm -hmm. And so multiple hosts, typically these are very, very low impact parasites. Right. In uh, uh, in the ideal situation, you don't even notice them. Yeah, exactly. That's the whole point is that I come in and go, and then I'm gone before it even bothers you. Yep. And that's it. Like, When you're bitten by a mosquito, it's not the blood they take that you notice. It's actually things in their saliva that irritate your skin that makes it itch. The amount of blood they took is not why it itches and is not why you feel it. It's purely just their saliva, unfortunately, caused a little rashy bump with us, which makes us go, ow, and slap it where it is. But otherwise, yeah, they, and we wouldn't even notice if we didn't feel that bump. Uh, which is a funny one to bring up because when we were talking about transmission of parasites, my first thought, probably the one of the most impactful parasites slash pathogens in the world is plasmodium. Yep. Which is a protist that causes malaria. Yep. <laughs> by riding between human and mosquito, taking its parasitic transmission during the parasitism <laughs> yep. of another organism. Those are known as vector transmitted parasites. Mm. And the vector is typically a micro predator. Right. They're being carried. Well, it's like the fleas yep. carrying the plague. Yeah. They are carrying a, a parasite or pathogen. And so the weird thing about that is that the mosquito is not poisoning you with malaria when it bites you. It is passing on its own parasitic infection. Yeah. It is also being... It's malaria. <laughs> yeah. It has malaria, but the parasites don't feed off the mosquito. It is purely a bus to get from a host who had malaria to B host who had malaria, who now has malaria, I should say. <laughs> and yeah, this is the thing that makes micro predators kind of weird because a purely clean world, mosquitoes would be no problem ever. Right, like, they're just taking some blood. No, yeah, like people are not, ant, livestock are not killed by vampire bats because they're drained. No. It's just, you get you lose a little blood and that's it. But they got a bunch of stuff in their blood and saliva. When you add vector transmitted parasites, now you get things like malaria, yeah, which it's is... That, it's that mosquito backwash. Exactly. <laughs> and now what should have been a very low impact parasite encounter can become one of the most devastating parasitic diseases on our planet. Oh, yeah. Like hundreds of thousands of people die a year from malaria. Malaria is one of the big ones. So big, big vector parasites make micro predators (laughs) a very different beast. So you have your parasites who are feeding on other organisms and then you have other parasites who are exploiting that relationship. For their own benefit, Mm -hmm. because like we said, it's parasites all the way down. All the way down. Now it gets weird. I'm so ready. (laughs) So is that four? (laughs) That's four so far. We've got two left, and boy, howdy. I know what one of them is. (laughs) These get so weird. (laughs) I'm going to do the probably weirdest first, in my opinion, the weirdest first, because the other one is a big topic. Parasitic castration. Hmm. 
is a very common lifestyle for many parasites where an organism blocks the reproduction or reproductive behavior of its host to then benefit off the now not utilized energy and resources that would have been used for the host's reproduction. Huh. Yeah, it gets now, real horrifying. Now it's sci-fi. <laughs> yes. This is, and there's lots of versions of this, and it may partially block the reproduction. It may just turn off the behavior. You know, the animal may still be able to reproduce, but just doesn't. And so instead of wasting time on seeking out mates and making nests and doing displays and mating and then growing a baby, all of that energy now can be used to benefit the parasite. Uh, I just realized where this is going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just remembered the example of this one. <laughs> this is one of the best parasite examples. The crab castrating barnacle. That's the one. Called Saculina carcinii, which is a parasitic barnacle. And yes, barnacle, those things that typically hang on the sides of piers and mm -hmm. whale noses. Except this one is a starts out as a mobile larva that seeks out crabs finds a weak part in the armor, typically around one of their hairs, the seti, and then morphs into a little injector to inject the next life phase of the parasite, which is, as the article I read called it, a blob called a vermigon. And the injecting life stage is called a kentragon because we're in sci-fi now. Yep. This blob goes on to form the adult barnacle, which has two parts. The externa, which becomes visible through the crab's exoskeleton, typically near the abdomen, usually in what would be the crab's brood pouch. Where it would hold its eggs mm -hmm. when it came time for eggs. This externa is the female reproductive structure of the barnacle. Inside the crab is the interna, which is a series of long filament root-like structures that permeate and invade the crab's whole body Yep, and takes it over to turn the crab's behavior to the parasite's benefit. The crab does not mate, but instead treats the barnacle, the externa, as it would its own brood. Cleans it, keeps it protected from the elements. Aerates it, and... That's what they would normally do with a clutch of eggs. Mm -hmm. Keep the water flowing over it, make sure nothing's bothering it. And when it comes time for the barnacle to reproduce, the crab will actively spread the barnacle's eggs like they would crab eggs by shaking them into the water. Yep, they flap their butts around mm -hmm. to send the what they're behaving like their babies off into the water. But it's the future parasites. Exactly. So, yeah, it gets real weird. <laughs> Hijacking the, the reproductive system of another organism, which I guess is kind of what viruses do, yeah. sort of, is hijacking the reproductive mechanism mm -hmm. of another organism. Yeah, and so it, it gets real weird. And mm -hmm. this one has a little blurry line to it because effectively, at least in this case and in many others, a parasitized host is reproductively killed. It will not pass on its genes. Right. So it hasn't, the it's... parasite hasn't killed them, but that line... Yeah, it has ended their bloodline. Exactly. Which, that's not, you're not killing the host, but you, evolutionarily you are. Yeah. So it has kind of a weird, weird gray area, which makes it similar to our next category. Which is my favorite category. I probably agree. The parasitoids. Mm. Parasitoids are organisms that live in close association, typically with a single host, that eventually results in the host's death. So they are living a very parasitic lifestyle off of one host, but they do it to the point that there is no host left. Right. That the host dies from it. So... This one really pushes the line between parasitism and predation. It's really weird. So you could almost look at this as predators who typically only kill one host per baby. And that's what it usually is, is them laying their young, putting their young on a host. The young eat that host to death and then mature. And then 
may not be predatory after that. Like they may not go hunting as adults, but that lifestyle to make new parasitoids kills at least one host. Yeah. So it's it gets real weird. These are typically insects of various groups and usually fall into one of two categories, which are the idiobiont or ectoparasitoids and the coenobiont or the endoparasitoids. So these are very similar to just your typical ectoparasites and endoparasites with a couple of extra rules. With the idiobionts, your ectoparasitoids, typically the host is captured, very often stung in some way that immobilizes them. Then they are carried back to the nest. And at this point, they're either made passive or they're dead. And then in the nest, eggs are laid on the host the egg, the nest is sealed and the eggs hatch and eat the food store, which is that host organism, mm -hmm. and then mature and come out. Right. Like I said, this could be that the parasitic parent kills the prey outright and then it's much more like prey feeding the young. But sometimes it's just, I'm going to paralyze you and then you're going to be alive in my basement until my eggs hatch and then they're going to eat you until you're dead. And that's what's going to happen. The coenobionts or where it gets really horrifying, because these eggs are typically laid inside the host, injected into the host, and then the young grow and feed off the host while it's still alive and active, usually. This do they don't paralyze the host in this case. It's still moving about, which means that the host can continue to develop while the parasitoid young also develop. So this happens a lot of times with things like caterpillars. Yep. The classic yep. wasp eggs in the caterpillar. And so they could be eating leaves and growing, but instead of making more caterpillar, that's going to make more parasitoid <laughs> baby bodies. And then the parasitoid larvae emerge from their host. Chest burst. Chest burst out because <laughs> these are xenomorphs. Yep. <laughs> and that's usually when the host dies. Though there are some who survive past that for a little bit. <laughs> Uh, there's one weird case where the caterpillar then helps protect the parasitoid larva oh, yeah. after they cocoon themselves and will even use its own silk to help cocoon them. Yeah. So it's 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 the parasitoid lifestyle, but also doing the barnacle crab thing. Yep, where there is also host ma manipulation. Yeah, we'll go over that in just a little bit, but that is not a feature unique to one strategy. Lots of parasites will change the way the host functions to benefit themselves and make them extra useful for feeding off of. Now, as I said, these are mostly insects that come from various groups. Uh, there's there's a bunch of diversity to this. The most common ones, though, are your coleoptera. Beetles. Your beetles. Your diptera. Flies. Flies. And then by far, the most common, most successful, most well-known are the parasitoid wasps. Your hymenopterans. This strategy is so successful that it is estimated about 10% of all described insect species are parasitoids. <laughs> and about three quarters of that 10% are parasitoid wasps. Yeah. Parasitoid wasps are ridiculously successful and super common, but they aren't the wasps we are typically interacting with, so they often go overlooked. And there is actually one bit of research that suggested that parasitoid wasps actually make up the majority of wasps. But more than 50%, one paper I found said 75% of hymenopterans are parasitoids. And there was a research that you mentioned in the insects episode that estimates that hymenoptera is actually more species rich than coleoptera, beetles, that wasps, ants, bees are actually more diverse than beetles even though we have more described beetles. And the research was actually using parasitoid wasp numbers yep. compared to host numbers that said, based on the sampling they did and the models they uh, found, the models they were working with, hymenopterans could be two and a half to three times more diverse than beetles because of parasitoid wasps. <laughs> yeah, because parasites tend to also be harder to study. Yes. Because uh, parasites aren't, they are often small, they're often only found in specific places on specific hosts, especially if you think of something like an endoparasite that's living inside 
something else's body. Yeah. It's very easy to overlook parasites. Well, and, and especially if you're not thinking to. Like, if you're not thinking about, hey, check every single animal for, you know, every single animal you dissect. Run, run tests for parasites. If that's not part of your practice, because mm-hmm. you're not thinking about parasites or that's not what you're looking for, then yeah, you're going to overlook them because they, they are hidden within the host yeah. <laughs> or actively trying to avoid detection. Now, parasitoid wasps use both life strategies of capturing, paralyzing and capturing a prey item. That's the, the tarantula hawk is the one I always think of that wrestles and stings a tarantula into submission, carries that now par- paralyzed tarantula back to its nest, buries it, lays eggs on it, and then the babies feed on these still living tarantula because you don't, because, because wasps. And then there are also plenty that fly around and inject their eggs into caterpillars of the famous one. Uh, there are lots of flies that do that to ants mm-hmm. and sp- like are super specific. I know there's one fly that is so specific it only does it to fire ants and has been used to eliminate fire ant colonies. Because once the fire ants are gone, there's no way for the fly to reproduce. And it right. just lays its egg right in the joint Behind the head of the ant, and the larva just burrows in there and takes over the ant's brain. And then, if I remember right with that one, the ant's head then pops off, and that's how the baby gets out. (laughs) But parasitoid wasps take an extra step in that many of them have a mutualistic relationship with a virus, a poly DNA virus that is in the ovaries of female parasitoid wasps and is injected into the host with the egg and with their sting. And then the virus hijacks the host's biology and starts reprogramming their cells to make it more suitable and beneficial to the parasite babies. And the really weird thing about it is that this virus is in the genome of the wasp. It's inherited from generation to generation. So these parasitoid wasps have a virus that literally terraforms the host. To make them a better home for their babies. Parasites all the way down. It's just so cool. Now those are the main strategies of versions of parasites. But there are lots of variations to those strategies. And these are some of the more common uh, uh, quote unquote types of parasites that you'll usually hear about. Where they are parasitizing in unusual ways or unusual things. You know they're benefiting from the host in a way that's not feeding off the blood. Some examples, social parasitism. And this is something found in social groups, often social insects, where a parasite benefits off the social structure of those organisms to typically benefit their young. An example of this is there are butterflies whose larva will infiltrate ant nests and then mimic signals of the ants, social signals. That tricks the ants into caring for and protecting the caterpillar. Right. This is like the uh, uh, cuckoo bees and mm-hmm. cuckoo birds that mm-hmm. will lay their eggs in someone else's nest and then leave that host to take care of their eggs for them. Yes, which is a version of social parasitism that's typically called brood parasitism. Yes, I've heard they call that. And so there are multiple examples where basically I have you take care of my baby or I have you take care of me. I mm-hmm. go in and trick you into thinking I'm part of your social network. Right. I am the queen now. Yep. And then you take care of me. Brood parasites, as you mentioned, cuckoo birds and the cuckoo bees. Uh, these are often highly specialized to the host, to tricking the host. Where right? Cuckoo birds will have eggs that look like the host's eggs. Cuckoo bees also place their young in other bees' hives. Mm-hmm. But... A lot of things don't categorize them under brood parasitism because the young aren't taken care of typically by the other bees. They just eat the food that's left there. Yes. Which would make them kleptoparasites. Which is possibly my favorite example. Type of parasitism. Same. Is parasites that are just stealing stuff yep. from other parasites. Uh, on the cuckoo bees, I know that some in some cases they will lay their egg in another bee's nest And their eggs oftentimes have evolved to hatch quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they hatch before the host's eggs and eat all the food. Yep, yep, yep. And at least in a couple of cases, they are are evolved to hatch quickly and also be big and strong 
So they can eat the other larvae. Yes. Yep. <laughs> when like cuckoo bees typically have stronger armor. Yes. And like are tougher so that if they're attacked while laying the eggs. Uh, cuckoo bird females, some of them look like hawks. So that while they're laying the egg in a host nest, they're not bothered. Cool. Kleptoparasitism, though, is just I'm stealing stuff. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's materials. You know, stealing nesting materials from mm-hmm. a rival. I'm stealing resources from you. And just straight up theft. There are so many examples of this. It's such a cool phenomenon behavior. And the the fun thing with this is there are obligate kleptoparasites that that they basically only survive by stealing from other animals or organisms. But they're for the most part it's facultative in that there's lots of animals that just when they decide to go. I don't feel like hunting today. I'm just gonna take food from this person right if you think about lions Mm -hmm. where it's like yeah they can hunt and they will hunt but if they come across a bunch of hyenas who just killed something yeah they'll go steal it yes i think my absolute favorite kleptoparasite example and i've written about this a couple times are those macaques Mm -hmm. in southeast Mm -hmm. asia there are so it's i guess it's not surprising at all to hear stories of monkeys stealing stuff from people yeah because yeah that's monkeys are mischievous and curious and intelligent and kleptoparasitic so yeah yeah. i've watched cartoons i know that's what they they take stuff there is at least a couple of cultural groups of some i forget which species it is but macaques in southeast asia that have developed the habit of stealing things from people and then trading them their stuff back for food for food Mm -hmm. so they'll like especially tourist areas like there are temples in certain areas where these monkeys are part of the region. And yeah, so and they're sacred. So they're they, sacred. So they they're... are encouraged to gather at the temples and tourists come by and the monkeys will like steal their glasses or their phones or whatever. And then they'll hold them hostage until the people give the monkeys food. And then they'll drop the stuff and run away. Yep. I actually, I wrote about this for earth touch mm-hmm, uh, several mm-hmm. years ago. And I was, I reached out to the researchers who had published a study about what groups do it and how they're they're doing this bartering behavior. And one of the questions I asked them is if the researchers had stuff stolen from them while studying the macaques. And they said, yeah, their research equipment would get stolen. And then they had to barter for their stuff back. Yep, they're real. The <laughs> macaques know what they're doing. So sometimes kleptoparasitism is very straightforward. Like, yeah, no, I live in the place where you're gathering your food and I just eat your food. Yeah, or I, I wait carefully until you're not paying attention and i swoop in grab your food and run away but it can also be really complex Mm -hmm. and much more intelligent multi-stage much more forward thinking this is a learned kleptoparasitic lifestyle yeah they are not born kleptoparasites they are taught a parasitic behavior steal and trade stuff yeah which is so cool and then really quick i wanted to mention parasitic plants of course Mostly just because we said every group of life has parasites, and that's very true. But parasitic plants also do it in a slightly different way because they're plants. A weird planty way. And it, some of them are particularly intense about it. Uh, it's also very common with them. It's thought that it's evolved roughly a dozen times in angiosperms, parasitism. And roughly up 1% of all angiosperms are parasites. Cool. All parasitic plants have special roots called hostoria, which are invasive feeder roots to infiltrate other plants. Right. Instead of roots that invade the soil, Mm -hmm. these are roots that invade the host plant. Exactly. And they're doing the same thing that they would do in the soil. They're taking in nutrients and water and food. Yeah. You can have obligate and facultative parasitic plants, but then you also have hemiparasitic plants, which under natural conditions would parasitize, but still can photosynthesize on their own. Holoparasitic plants don't have chlorophyll. Yeah. And so they can't make their own food. Yeah, they have to siphon off food from other plants. There are also plants that can parasitize on the stem and like trunk of a plant, but there's also ones that can be doing it underground at the other roots of other plants. Mm Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, like if you're walking through a field, some of those plants might be eating their neighbors and you can't tell. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what's so cool about plant parasitism is that sometimes it's nutrients, right? Mm -hmm. It's I am dug into you and sucking up 
nutrients or water. I'm thinking of the Rafflesia example, yep, the yep, corpse yep. flower, which lives on grapevines and takes the water from them so it can grow into the largest flowers on the planet. That smells like death. But I'm also thinking of parasitism and things like kudzu, Mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. what you're stealing is height. Yeah, I'm growing on you to get sunlight. I'm stealing your sunlight. I'm stealing your big, sturdy tree shape. That's what I'm exploiting, and I'm just growing on you to take your sunlight. Yep. And so, yeah, plants can be just as parasitic. It can be just as diverse and aggressive and horrifying. So, yeah, parasites, they're doing pretty well. Successful strategy. And they've been successful for a while, but studying them in the past can sometimes be very tricky because the fossil record of parasites is not quite as numerous as they are in our everyday life. Yeah. Well, and so much of it is behavioral. Yeah. That it can be really tough. One of my favorite things about the diversity of parasites present and as we will discuss here in a moment Mm -hmm. past is that it's so successful. It's so widespread. And it really drives home the fact that one of the absolute best ways to survive in nature on this planet is to cheat. Yes, absolutely. If you don't have to do the work, why would you? Yep. So after this break, we'll discuss what they were doing in the past, or at least what we've been able to find out they were doing. Considering how common parasites are, they actually fossilize very uncommonly. They are fairly rare in the fossil record. Many of them are invertebrates and therefore soft and squishy. A lot of times they are hidden within the soft tissues. Mm -hmm. They're often very small. And there is the fact to be noted that they may often be overlooked. I was just going to say... Uh, uh, by virtue of their lifestyle, parasites tend to live on bigger mm-hmm. organisms. So, yeah, if you're digging up a super cool ju- fossil of a big cool animal, yeah, you might not be looking for the t- all the myriad tiny things that lived alongside it. Yeah, we came to this fossil site f- for the Triceratops. We didn't come necessarily looking for parasites. So, yeah, parasites are not super well-known, or as well-known as you would expect them to be from the fossil record. That's not to say we don't have fossil parasites. We actually have a good number, but they do not fossilize as commonly as one would expect for their diversity in numbers. So that makes some things about understanding the history of parasites difficult. We're lacking some key information. There's plenty of ecosystems that we don't really know what the parasite side of the ecology was. So we're missing a lot of the, you know, according to estimates for today, up to 50% of the diversity of that ecosystem. And so that's going to affect a lot of the dynamics between the different organisms there. We also don't have a good understanding of how extinctions affect parasites. It would make sense that if the host's are going extinct because the environment's changing, that it would affect the parasites, but we don't know how much. You know, are, paras- are most parasites able to switch hosts before that host goes extinct? Or if a host goes extinct, is that almost a death sentence for the parasite? We, we don't fully know. You know, so some big questions are still remaining. And it's a shame that we don't find them more often because if we find a parasite whose life cycle we know pretty well, you know, if a tapeworm or some, a tick that is recognizable and we know how it lives, that can tell us about the organism that it was found with, that it was the host that it was parasitizing. We now can know more about that animal's or that organism's biology. And so finding parasites will be a big deal for understanding both their history, but also how these past ecosystems were functioning. And so so there's some difficulty with understanding where parasites have truly come from. But we do still find parasites. And one of the things you have to first do when you find a parasite is identify that it's a parasite. You know, confirm that this is indeed a parasitic worm and not just a worm. And there are some things you have to look for when trying to ID a parasite. The first and probably most obvious is, does it look like a parasite? 
Does it have parasitic features? And that is to say that lots of parasites are specialized for being a parasite. Right. If you if you look at like a louse or a tick, mm-hmm. that body shape, those legs are good for one real good thing, and that is clinging on to other organisms. Yeah, it's like if you, if anyone's ever seen a tick walking around, it's not that they can't walk, but they're not fast. If you flip them over on their back, they're real bad at getting up again. That's not what their bodies are for. They're meant for grabbing on to you, and their face is good for one thing, and that's eating off of you. And that's it. So if you find a fossil organism that has those features... That can give you good hints that you're looking at a parasite, or at least maybe something that could be parasitic. One of the classic things to look for are loss of certain traits. A lot of external parasites, especially insect parasites, this is very well known, have lost certain things like flight. Because they don't need to fly anymore because the hosts move them around. Right. A lot of parasitic plants lose their chlorophyll. So if you find a fossil of a what looks like a parasitic organism and it's missing the things that it would need to survive without a host. Pretty good indication that it probably was using a host for those things. Yeah, there are morphological features you can look for. There are also trace evidences that you can look for for signs of parasitism. You know, and that this may be, you may not find the parasite, but that an organism was parasitized because it's showing the the traces, the scars right. of having a parasite. One really cool example of this is on a lot of tyrannosaurid skulls around the mouth, around the muzzle, there were these smooth-edged, like, eroded sections. These scarring on the mouth of these tyrannosaurids that initially were thought to be actual scars from physical damage. Mm -hmm, From biting each other's faces and stuff. or, Or fighting with prey and stuff like that. But another look at them, a survey of tyrannosaurids with these markings found that they actually look a lot like the lesions found on modern birds from a parasite called trichomonosis, which is a a parasitic infection that causes these lesions around the mouth. It is particularly common in raptors and seems that these theropod dinosaurs also had if not trichomonosis, something very similar to it. Yeah, we talked uh, with Laura in episode 84 about how parasites and other infections can leave signs on the bone. Exactly. Uh, we even, uh, I think we've mentioned before that at the gray fossil site, we will find uh, twigs, mm-hmm. fossilized twigs mm-hmm. with galls in them. Where a parasite was living inside the plant. Yeah. So trace fossils can be very helpful, but the golden ticket is finding parasite and host fossilized together. Right. That's that's what you want. That yes. that direct evidence. Here's the parasite parasitizing. Mm-hmm. Caught in the act. Yeah. And now that's not to say every time you find a little organism on a bigger one, you found a parasite. They're right. Symbiosis and mutualism. Uh, other and, forms and, of symbiosis. And sometimes just being buried on top of each other. Yeah. It can happen. Well, it's, I've had bugs crawl on me that weren't parasites. Yeah. <laughs> like something land on me and then get caught in my, my fur for a little bit. <laughs> Uh, Had I been fossilized in that moment, it would have been very misleading. But there are some very good examples. There's actually a couple of specimens, uh, insects in amber with helminth worms, which are internal parasitic worms, leaving their body. Yeah, yeah, because they start dying. Uh Uh-huh. And the amber surrounds the body and is killing the host and suffocating the host. So the parasites try to bail Mm -hmm. and get caught in the amber. And so that we do have some examples where it's like, no, you were caught leaving, like the crawl- scene of the crime. <laughs> crawling through the window out of the living room. Yep. You, you're a parasite. That's a parasite. And then we do get some wonderful examples that kind of roll all these together. There was once again, an Amber example. So hundred million year old Mesozoic Cretaceous Amber with some feathers, some dinosaur feathers preserved in it with tiny ancient lice on the feathers yeah which which made all the headlines these are very lice-like they've got tiny wingless bodies they've got a head with strong chewing mouth parts robust short antennae with long seti long hairs coming off of it the legs that have one claw one little hook-like claw and long hairs as well they're not 
entirely like modern lice. Some of those features are very different. The hairs are unusual. The mouth parts aren't quite as specialized as our lice today. But overall, that's a very lice-like body. Yeah, they're built to be an ectoparasite. To hang on and to chew on their prey. And the feathers they were preserved with show signs of chewing. Yeah. Very likely from these parasites. So they're, they have parasite bodies. They are similar and likely related to living parasites. They were found with the host or part of the host. And the part of the host had signs, trace, traces of parasite activity. Yes. Pretty much the gold standard for this is a parasite. That parasitic perfection. These were named mesophthorus, which means mesozoic lice. Yep. Mesozoic louse. <laughs> So we do have some good fossil examples. And there are some, like, famous noteworthy ones. There's a lot of the, like, old parasite examples. Like, we even have DNA from ancient parasites. Mm -hmm. There is DNA taken from a a coprolite that was 17,000 years old, likely from a large cat that seems to have tiny eggs, look like nematode eggs, which are little round worms. And we were able to pull DNA from it, and yeah, it sure does seem like these are parasitic nematode eggs in the droppings of a big cat. Yeah, uh, uh, fossil poop is a great place to look for parasites. Absolutely. As we discussed in episode 30, uh, where I think in that episode we talked about uh, uh, there is a, a well-known example of tapeworm eggs in shark poop. Yep. Which I believe are the oldest, the oldest evidence of tapeworms. I want to say it was like Permian or Carboniferous, late Paleozoic, a very ancient example. Yeah, absolutely. And so poop can be very helpful because that's where a lot of internal parasites pass their next generation out of the body to get into other hosts. Yeah, or just their dead bodies as they're removed from the body. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. The remains of the parasite. We even have fossil parasitoids. We talked about this on the news. A bunch of fly pupae metamorphosing young flies. Right, between larva and adult. That when were mineralized and scanned, micro x-ray scanned, and found that out of about 1,500 pupa, 55 of them had wasp embryos, had wasp larvae in the pupa, and most of them were actually almost adult wasps. They just replaced the pupa and were inside the little cocoon. Just about ready to break out. And so these were about 30 to 40 million years old, and... There's evidence of parasitoids way before that. But yeah, we even have good evidence of those wasps doing what they do. This is the one that I always love because one of the new species was named Xenomorphia. Yep. Because, yes. (laughs) Because that's what it is. And then there is the example of what may be the oldest parasites we've ever found, which go back to the Cambrian just over 500 million years ago, which are worms attached to the shells of brachiopods, which are the clam-like organisms, the shellfish-like organisms of the past that were that were very numerous in the past. And they're attached to the shell facing the opening of the brachiopod where it would open and feed. Right. They're the, basically the intake area mm-hmm. where the brachiopod would absorb... Bring in water. To siphon out food. Mm-hmm. You had these worms that appear to have been hanging over in that direction to... Grab up food. Yeah, that may have been interrupting the flow of water to steal the food before it got to the brachiopod. Yeah, a, a Cambrian kleptoparasites. Yep. And so that may be our earliest example of parasites. Very likely not the first parasite. Right. But the f- earliest one we found, which really does seem to indicate that, yeah, as soon as we had life and organisms... We had parasites. Yeah, the, the the Cambrian is some of the early, some of the very earliest animal ecosystems, and so even in these earliest animal ecosystems, you had animals parasitizing other animals. Yes, that it ju- it's just a winning strategy. Which brings us to the question of how does it evolve? You know, if it's so successful and it's evolved so many times, how does an organism go from being a normal law-abiding or- organism, as we said, <laughs> to a parasite. Yeah, I guess sometimes it, it it makes a lot of sense with, like, the worms on the brachiopod. Well, if you're a type of worm that encrusts mm-hmm. in places with water flow, well, okay, now you're just encrusting on a shell. 
but you're basically doing the same thing. Yes. So sometimes it's pretty straightforward, but also sometimes parasites are really bizarre and specific. Well, especially when we get to the ones that can't survive without a host. Like, right, right. Well, yeah, presumably a worm that does something like that. If you just stuck them in another place with a nutritious current, mm-hmm. well, I, one would assume they would do fine. Yeah, like if I just feed, you know, if I, I just provide food for gulls, and, you know, or, or the the macaques, they're not going to just be like, yeah, but I, I can't live without the thrill of the, the theft. <laughs> like, yeah, they don't need to steal. Right. They just... That is much easier than finding their own food. If the food was easily available, they would stop being kleptoparasites. Right. Does a bird have to pick ticks off of a rhino? Mm-hmm. Well, could it just as easily be eating bugs off of trees? That's just a convenient place to do yeah. it. If, yeah. If suddenly bugs on trees became more convenient, would they stop you know, bothering the rhinos? Right. That's an easy transition. And as far as parasites go, there is no one answer for how does one become a parasite. Because there's no one answer to how does one be a parasite. (laughs) Exactly. So there is not a trend toward parasitism. There's a million trends. But there are a couple of patterns that show up in the evolution of parasitism for the fact that, as was mentioned earlier, they seem to be very convergent. Mm -hmm. Parasites seem to converge on those six strategies. Yeah, when you we were talking about this before the episode and you told me that you had come across a, a reference to a, a set list of mm-hmm. strategies and my initial response was like, "Really?" Yeah. That's I cuz I would expect them to be unclassifiable almost mm-hmm. because of their diversity. And now those six categories are not necessarily about the ways that these parasites survive or what they're feeding on or how they're getting it, but more focus on the parasite host relation. Right. Is it one parasite to one host? Is it one parasite to multiple hosts? Are you inside the host? Are you outside? And so are you needing the host to take you somewhere for your next stage of life? Or are you using a single host for kind of parasite? The six categories are still very vague in exactly what you're doing to the host. And how you're doing it and what you're getting from the host. But those six strategies, direct, trophic, vector, micro-predator, castration, and parasitoid, seem to be the six strategies that at least eukaryotic parasites continue to come back to and continue to land on. So it's kind of weird. One part of this is that once a group, you know, species taxa becomes parasitic, they're really under the same selective pressures as every other parasite. They're, regardless of what they are, plant, fungus, animal, and regardless of what they're parasitizing, there are a few problems they have to solve as a parasite. They have to get to the host, Mm -hmm. from one host to another host somehow. They have to invade and survive in the host. They have to affix themselves. They have to not be done away with by host defenses. And then they have to get resources sustainably from the host. And... Regardless of what you are, those three problems are always going to be there for a parasite. So they're under very similar selective pressures, which may be why we keep seeing very, very convergent lifestyles or systems among completely unrelated and super diverse parasites. So it's kind of a contradictory situation. Another thing that we do tend to see with parasites is co-evolution with their host. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is going to be as diverse as every pair or, you know, menage, however many parasites are on that host. (laughs) Every grouping can have its own coevolutionary trend. But this is a phenomena of though these two organisms are living in opposition to one another. I don't want this parasite on me and this parasite is trying to hurt me. We are still linked And the interactions of one's evolution can affect the other's evolution, which means you can see similar evolutionary phylogenies and patterns between a host and a parasite to the point that parasites have been used to link closely related host species. Right. That if my lice are similar to your lice, it may mean that we have an ancestral connection because... Our lice have evolved with us 
as we diverged from an ancestor. Yeah, yeah, we talked about this in the insects episode, mm-hmm, in episode mm-hmm. 99, that there have been a couple of examples of insect parasites evolving along with their hosts i could think i I saw examples in birds and i think it was ground squirrels or some Uh, yeah gophers gophers i mean that was it where the phylogeny the evolutionary relationship tree of the host animals looks very similar to the evolutionary tree of the parasites because every time the hosts split into multiple species the parasites go with them. Yep, this is called co-speciation. Yep, they're developing species in the same patterns as each other because it, it, if you think about it, co-evolution makes a ton of sense for parasites because what evolution does is it fosters the change in an organism in response to its environment mm-hmm. as the environment changes. And for a parasite, the host is the environment. Exactly. Uh, I found one source that described that Co-spe- that co-speciation can often be passive for the parasite because it's trapped on an island that is its host. Right. Its host species. Yeah. So it's just genetic drift means that it's going to become different than the lice that only hang out on crows because it only hangs out on bluebirds. So inevitably, they're not going to cross mate. Yeah. And there's going to be no gene flow, so they will speciate. And you remember episode 98 about speciation, mm-hmm. right? That's the classic allopatric... You've split the population. In this case, you've split the population between different host populations. Yes. And there also there can be an active, you know, a, a true selective pressure aspect to it of if I become specialized for this host, I can't jump on to other hosts because I don't fit that puzzle piece. Right. Uh, they did an experiment with uh, bird lice where there are lice on different sized birds and then they switched them, took the lice from small birds, put them on bigger birds bigger bird lice, put it on smaller birds. And they were trying to see three things. Can the lice connect to, hang on to the different sized host, the the wrongly sized host? Can they feed off the wrongly sized host? And then can they survive the wrongly sized host's defenses? In this case, preening. Mm -hmm. Cleaning of the feathers. Exactly. Can the host with wrong sized lice on them get them off more easily? And what they found is, yeah, when you switch them, the lice hang on and they feed fine. But then when the preening happens, typically they're removed from the host that's not the size that they are adapted for. Right. They've adapted to avoid a certain beak size yeah. or certain preening behavior. So now you, not only do you have kind of the island situation going, but it's I can't even boat over to the other island because it's Arctic for some reason. Right. My Co- boat can't go through the ice. Exactly. And I can't get there. You know, or there's a reef around that island. I, I can't, I couldn't populate it if I wanted to. So you could be trapped on your host because the other hosts don't fit your lifestyle or your anatomy. This leads us to what is sometimes known as Fahrenholtz rule, suggested by Henrik Fahrenholtz in 1913, who proposed that phylogenies of host and parasites will eventually become congruent over time through coevolution and co-speciation. And that often more closely related parasites will be found on more closely related hosts. Makes sense. So, yeah. The same reason that species living on clo- nearby islands are t- typically more closely related than species on distant islands. Yes. So we do have some trends. We do have some patterns in parasite evolution. There are a couple of big questions when it comes to why would parasites evolve this way, or how could you achieve the lifestyle you have? Two of the weird ones is trophic transmitted parasites, ones that have to be eaten. What would drive a parasite to include being consumed as part of its life right. cycle? You, you have been selected for living in a host that is doomed. Yeah. And then the other one is parasitoids. How do we get... Because it's such a diverse lifestyle... How are they getting to this weird, not quite normal parasite lifestyle? With trophic transmission, there's basically two main hypotheses for how this could happen. And it could be happening, either one could be happening in different groups. It's not like one's the right answer. But these are two ways that, hypothetically, a parasite could go from living in a single host to now having multiple hosts. One that is eaten by the final host. And basically the two scenarios just change in which host they start in. The first scenario deals with the idea that the definitive host, the one that the parasite reproduces in, was the one and only host. 
Mm-hmm. And then at some point when the eggs or offspring of the host are passed, when the eggs or offspring of the parasite are passed out of the host, a other organism got in the way and intercepted, ate them, became infected with them accidentally. And that it happened so frequently that now that is a constant part that very often a lot of the parasite propagules, as they're sometimes called, yeah. are intercepted by an intermediate non-intended host. Right. And then if that non-intended host is either becomes or is already part of the diet of the intended host, the parasites that can survive the brief period in the intermediate host to get back to the intended one have selective pressures to be successful. And now the mouse that eats your propagules or becomes infected with your propagules is a normal part of the cycle. Right. Which I I guess when you think about it, make can make sense so i'm thinking of you know birds through frogs then you got to be eaten by birds again i can imagine a scenario where it can actually end up being harder to get from bird to bird Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that if it turns out that all you have to do is survive produce enough babies and make sure that those babies and larvae can survive going through a couple other hosts then you don't actually have to do much Mm -hmm. to end up back in a bird eventually and that that selective pathway might actually be easier yes in a strange way than being selected to you know fly on the wind or or swim to a certain place you don't have to do much yeah exactly the other scenario is that what is now the intermediate host was the original definitive host Mm mm-hmm And then a predator came along, a new predator, and started eating your hosts. Started preying on the host organism. And now your home is getting devoured. Right. You you had all these nice frogs. Yes. And then these birds came along. And just started gobbling them up. Before you could even finish your reproductive cycle. So now those parasites that can transition to this new forced upon them host are going to be more successful than the ones that die with the... Intended host. Right. If it takes you a certain while to get to your reproductive behavior, and in that time your host is likely to get eaten, then it is advantageous if you just extend your cycle to, okay, we'll just reproduce in this new host. Yes. We're going to, okay, we are just going to keep doing what we would have done, but now here. And then you become so good at it. That the, and it's reliable enough, mm-hmm. which is the other part, you know, I, 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 you always think of stuff like this as like, well, that's how unlikely is that? But really it persists because of just how many parasites there are. And in this case, intermediate hosts. And how many intermediate hosts there are. This strategy, they've, they, many scientists have said, likely only works if the intermediate host greatly outnumbers the final host. That the prey items that are going to be eaten have to be very numerous so that any frog you hop into has a high chance of getting eaten. Right. And so these are two ways that a single host parasite could go to having multiple hosts in its life cycle. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to the final question of why not just parasitize? Like, why do you want to be eaten? What's the benefit of being eaten? Because it is a very successful life cycle. What's the benefit to being eaten? Why, like in the example of a new host showing up and interrupting, why not just parasitize that one? Right. Why keep going through the whole yeah. thing? Or, or why not just speed up your reproduction and do it real quick so that you're not getting eaten? Exactly. Yeah. One hypothesis suggests that the predator, the final host, the definitive host, is a site for all parasites to get together and mate. Oh, it's eating lots of frogs. Yeah, because of bioaccumulation, a predator will end up with more parasites than the lower down the food chain prey items Mm. because it's eating lots of prey items, which means there's just a party of parasites in it that can now crossbreed and mate if it's a parasite where breeding is beneficial. Right. It also occurs to me, and we're using the example of birds, but you did mention that the, 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 the main host tends to be 
vertebrates. Yes. And in the examples I can think of, they are often larger vertebrates. Yes. So there could also be a dispersal factor here. Oh, yeah. That absolutely. if you're, you know, accumulating parasites in this bird and then that bird's flying all over the place, pooping your eggs out, you're producing lots of eggs from lots of parasites in an animal that is spreading them far and wide. Thus, they are likely to end up in lots of next hosts down the line. Yeah, so there's benefits to moving to a bigger member, <laughs> to, to moving up the food chain hierarchy. Yeah. And hanging out with the elite. Yeah, friends in high places. Exactly. <laughs> so. Cool. It's what seems like a counterintuitive, what seems like a counterintuitive life strategy to be consumed actually may have some big benefits and could happen multiple ways. Yeah. So not as crazy as it seems. That's cool. Because I remember watching, uh, there was, I think this was a Parasites example of Animal Planet's The Most Extreme. Most Extreme. Where it was the Lancet fluke mm -hmm, going mm -hmm. through the, and I remember thinking at the time, how does that even happen? Yeah, that's so but complex. Th no, that, that, makes, that makes some sense. Yeah. Parasitoids are a little bit different. They have evolved numerous times. In flies, it's estimated that parasitoidism has evolved 21 different times. Whew. But not all of them have had so many evolutionary origins. According to most research in hymenopterans, in parasitoid wasps, it evolved once. Wow. Just one time that really took off. Yeah. But there are multiple groups that have it, so there are multiple options for how it could have come about. There's basically three origins that are suggested by most of the research, and it's that they started at out eating either fungus or dead organisms or started as predators. Mm -hmm. And with the fungus, basically it would be that I lay my larva in a log to eat the fungus there. Uh, there are some wasps that actually inject their egg into like dead logs and then inject mutualistic fungus or fungal encouraging chemicals to grow a fungus for their baby to eat. Cool. And that, then other wasps could start kleptoparasitizing those by laying their eggs in those burrows to steal the fungus from other female wasps. And we do have examples where there are individuals who don't make their own fungus and just use the fungus provided by others. Mm -hmm. And then it would be a, a hop and a skip to you lay your egg in the fungus hole or on the dead body that the larva is eating and then it kills the other larva to then eat its so food source. Mm -hmm. And then it just kills the larva by eating the larva. Now it's just more beneficial to lay your eggs next to other like people's babies. Directly in there. Mm -hmm. With predators, it would basically be that I'm gathering food to feed my babies. And then it just extends the feeding on to one host. Right. You can, you can imagine... A scenario of, you know, doing the bird thing. I eat some food. I bring some back. I spit it up for my babies mm -hmm. to the, well, why don't I just paralyze the food and take the whole thing back to my babies, yep. put the food next to my egg to then, well, why don't I lay the eggs closer to the food mm -hmm. until eventually it's just I'll put the egg right in the food and then I leave. Yeah. And that's similar to the ones that are eating dead material. Because what they described there is that it would just be a timing shift. Of, yep. <laughs> instead of eating dead material, I'll just eat weakened organisms. And then eventually I'm just going to go look for still alive functioning organisms. And then the parents just laying the eggs closer to the still alive organisms to laying it on yeah. the still alive organisms. <laughs> well, and especially since insects already have ovipositors that are real good for injecting eggs into yeah, places. saw flies. <laughs> Precise placement. And yet, yeah, inside of plants or inside of carcasses, it really isn't all that different to land on a caterpillar who can't do anything about it and just put yeah. your eggs in there. And there's more details on exactly how that could happen in different groups and with different lifestyles. If you want a parasitoid episode, just ask and it, sh <laughs> it will happen. It shall be done. Because, oh, parasitoids. And this is by no means the end to the diversity of parasitic evolution. No. But it is the end of our discussion. Oh. <laughs> well, how about that? <laughs> because this is, this is kind of where we're going to cap it off. Because yeah, there's so much. Yeah, there's so many rabbit holes. This was a very 
daunting episode in just the fact that all parasites are so cool. Yep. And so interesting. So now we just need people to request episodes on more specific yes. topics within this topic. Absolutely. And we will make it make it happen. Do you have a favorite parasite? Let us know and make it an episode request at the same time. <laughs> we'll start adding it to the list. But before we fully wrap up, we have a patron question. Hey, that's right, we do. Yeah. So on our Patreon, if you sign up for that level where we shout your name out, you can also ask us questions that we'll answer here on the podcast. And we have one of those prepared for this episode. David, what's our question? This question is not about parasites at all. Oh, that's not fitting. Off topic. <sighs> way, way to plan ahead, patron. It's about dinosaurs. Okay, that's pretty cool. All right. <laughs> Cheryl, this is actually a, a question about dinosaurs and terminology. Oh. And it's a question that I've seen come up among our listeners a few times, so this, this will very, be a fun one to answer. This is a very David question. <laughs> it is. Cheryl asks about the terms bird-hipped and lizard-hipped in dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So as a refresher, bird-hipped and lizard-hipped are the groups that we typically traditionally split dinosaurs into Ornithischia, which is your Triceratops, Ankylosaurus, Stegosaurus, etc., and Saurischia, sauropods and theropods, which are words that mean bird-hipped, Ornithischia, and lizard-hipped, Saurischia. Because of the shape of the hip bones. Yes, they both those two groups have distinctive features on their hips that separate the groups. Right. Cheryl says, I learned that those were the distinctions between dinosaur groups. I've been using them ever since. But you, meaning us, mm -hmm. we, we the hosts, mentioned that it was a no-no. Cheryl specifies my words. Mm -hmm. Not me, David, but Cheryl. I'm curious why it was used then and not now. Yeah. It's the, I remember as a little kid running into this problem because they were like, we have the bird hipped and lizard hipped dinosaurs. Right. And as a very clever little kid, I was like, I bet I know which one the bird hipped dinosaurs and, are. And you were wrong. And then I was very wrong. <laughs> so this is where people will get uh, this gets confusing. And I've, like I said, I've seen a bunch of our listeners mention this. Ornithischia means bird hipped and Saurischia means lizard hipped because of the shape of their hips are similar to living birds versus living lizards. Yes, like superficially, they look more right. similar to those two groups. But birds are Saurischians. Yes, they, they are lizard hipped dinosaurs. Within theropods, because as you get close to birds, the hip structure evolves into a different shape that is more similar to the other side of the dinosaur family tree. Convergently, their hips end up looking the same, but not due to the group they came from. Right. So it's not that those terms are really a no-no. It's just that, as as is so often the case with scientific terminology, literally translating them from their roots is confusing. Well, it's it's... Very similar to the reason, like, at the aquarium, all of our signage, and whenever we talk to people, they weren't starfish, they were sea stars. Right. Because even though for many people who are, you know, have a biology background, they're like, well, yeah, I know they're not fish, but we just call them that. For those who don't have a biology background, it's very confusing, I can tell you from experience. It It is literally mincing words. Right. <laughs> so it doesn't... It doesn't describe them accurately. And these terms have that problem of there is an old reason why they were named that. Mm -hmm. It is not meant to be literally evolutionary dis a description for them, but it's still a confusing name. And it's right. still inaccurate to our current understanding of them. This is much like uh, I learned this for our last episode, sauropods, which I knew sauropod means lizard foot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I learned that the reason it is lizard foot is because unlike most dinosaurs, all five digits on the feet of sauropods touch the ground. Oh, uh, yeah. So if you think of many uh, dinosaurs and other animals, some of the fingers or toes are held off the ground, yep. like a dew claw in a cat or dog. So when sauropods were named, it was, oh, yeah, lizard feet. All the, the fingers touch the ground. It walks just like a lizard. Leaving out the fact that, A, a lot of tetrapods, like most tetrapods are like that. It's not just a lizard yeah, thing. Bears are sauropods. And B, that's the only similarity <laughs> between sauropod feet and lizard feet. And it's a bit of a danger. Uh, it, it's really catchy to to give the translations. Oh, tyrant lizard king. 
But when these names were given many, many decades ago, yeah. it has become confusing. So there's nothing wrong with the terms. Now, here's a little aside. If you remember our first ever But We Digress was about the Ornithoskeleta hypothesis, yep. which suggested that the ornithischia sauritia split might not actually be accurate. accurate to the evolutionary history of dinosaurs, which is a discussion that is still, uh, as far as I know, ongoing. I haven't heard much else about it. So for Same. the time being, we're still going with ornithischia sauritia. But yeah, there is that aspect that those terms might actually scientifically, evolutionarily be incorrect. Be incorrect uh, as we learn more. But setting that aside for the time being, it's really just that their literal translations suggest a relationship that isn't there. Yeah. Because just the shape of the hip is something that can evolve in different ways. And indeed, birds evolve that shape separately from the, quote, bird-hipped mm -hmm. dinosaurs. So there's nothing wrong with the terms. You just got to be careful with throwing them around. How literally uh, you're describing those. Uh, because, yeah, I've, I've seen tons of people who are very confused about it because they're not introduced to it as, hey, scientific terms. They are told these dinosaurs have bird hips and these dinosaurs have lizard hips, neither of which is accurate. No. Because birds are not part of the bird hip dinosaurs and lizards are not part of the lizard hip dinosaurs. It's just a descriptive term. Yes. Like sauropod lizard feet. It's not a literal term. And it's the kind of thing that I hope paleontologists continue to move away from yeah. <laughs> naming things like that. Because, yeah, it's confusing. And then if the ornithoskeleta hypothesis turns out to be correct, then we'll update that. Then that'll and just, it'll solve all the problems. <laughs> So thanks, good yeah, good thanks question. for asking that, Cheryl. I, I, that's a good one because I, I think that's the kind of question that will be handy for hopefully lots of people who are also confused about those terms. Absolutely. And with that, we can start drawing this episode to a close. Thank you to all of our requesters because parasites was a really fun topic. Cool topic. Thanks to all of our new patrons. Yes. And our old patrons. Absolutely. Thank you for your support. If you want to ask us questions for our Q&A, it's still open. Go open until December 15th. Check if, it out. If you're listening to this early enough, head over to our social media for the Q&A, the question submission form, and then keep your ears out. Uh, that, the Q&A itself, the answers will be coming out around the time of the next episode. Yep. Check out the blog post for links and pictures and more info and stuff. And we release episodes every fortnight. So the, the next episode will be the last episode of the year. Yeah. Episode 103. The final episode of 2020. How about that? So looking forward to the episode after that, particularly, because <laughs> it will be the first episode of not 2020. How about that? <laughs> Surely 2021 will be better. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it's known that January 1st changes everything. Right. It That's makes everything the... different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bye. See you next time, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.